Thank you for attending my presentation today. To be honest, I am not a natural public speaker, nor have I really practiced for this speech. So for this presentation, I will be mostly be reading from a script, which I typed up last minute <laughs> this morning. Okay, so raise up hands. How many of you are below age 21 years old? <laughs> how many of you have children at the age of 10 or above? And how many of them have access to the internet unsupervised? So that's most of them. Uh, well, unfortunately, chances are these kids have already somehow been exposed to this new drug. When we think about drugs, what usually comes to mind are addictive substances that can be smoked or inhaled through the nostrils. Well, those would be considered tangible substances, as they can be physically touched. On the other hand, there are intangible substances or addictions that cannot be touched, but can be seen or acted on. For instance, a highly addictive, a highly addictive gambling game, such as poker, would be considered an intangible substance or addiction. Today, I'll be presenting an intangible substance or drug that isn't talked about in most schools, and certainly wasn't talked about much while growing up. This drug didn't become the new drug of today until the 80s during the Playboy era of magazines, and until the 90s when we began having access to the internet. This drug is considered taboo, yet normalized. It's considered taboo because people, including parents, refuse to talk about it with their kids or in public. And it's normalized because a lot of kids and people think it's harmless. The drug I'm talking about is pornography, which is highly addictive, especially for children and youth, as their young brains are going through a major development. And despite popular belief, fact is, pornography isn't harmless. The scary thing is, it's almost everywhere. It's almost everywhere we go in advertisements, billboards, commercials, books, video games, newspapers, and even movies. Who here ever went on a normal looking website and someone had pop up ads of home? Yeah. <coughs> Watching most all of us. Yeah, that used to be really common back then, but now with access to internet, internet better than Internet Explorer, we no longer have to worry much about those ads popping up out of nowhere. With growing technology, though, porn has become easily accessible and can be exposed against a person or child's will, especially within our sexually obsessed culture. So now we can't afford to stay silent on this topic with our children, yet sadly, the word porn alone is enough to scare out a lot of people. And in order to improve society, we must bring awareness to the problem. So I'll ask if all of you can repeat this word after me. Pornography. 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 This will be quite an interacting presentation, so I highly encourage you to help us out by answering questions that I will ask. And if you have any long questions, you can wait until the end of the presentation when I'll be answering questions after the break during Q&A. So I'll start off with an overview of what I'll be talking about. The definition of pornography, three ways um, porn harms, such as the brain, heart, and world, internet safety, and making a world change. So what is pornography? Porne is a Latin word, and it means prostitute. Graphia is Greek, and it means a writing, drawing, or recording, or even films. So if we add the two words, porne and graphia, it will equal pornography, which basically means film prostitution and then kid language, bad pictures. Mm -hmm. So first off, how does porn affect the brain? Well, we'll start off with this common quote. Um, because some of you here are Christians, I added a few biblical quotes that speaks out against porn within this presentation. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Romans 8, 6. So raise up hands. Can anyone explain what this quote means? Yes. If we're going by our uh, body desire, like food, excessive food, or that kind of pornographic kind of images that some people get connected with, 
that is not really living by the spirit of God and the spirit of there's no peace in not long term in, in life. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so yeah, basically, um, when our mind um, is consuming all of these visuals and all of these junk, um, basically, it becomes a part of our lifestyle and how we think. So when um, Mahatma Gandhi's quote, um, it's something that goes along this line, uh, whatever you consume eventually becomes um, your thoughts, your thoughts becomes your words, your words become your actions. So basically that's, that's what it means, this quote. Mm -hmm. And so scientific evidence um, behind the harms of porn, including porn addiction, wasn't publicly, wasn't publicly discovered until a couple of years ago by psychologists, university professors, neuroscientists, and a neurosurgeon. Neural stands for brain. So a neurosurgeon is someone, um, a doctor who performs surgery on the brain. And by the way, neurosurgery is the toughest and highest paying career within the medical field. I will now show a short video on what porn does to the brain. You can read Korean, right? Eh? <laughs> 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 I can't read Korean. I wish I can, though. <laughs> Sure how slow the internet is. We have internet, right? Yeah, we're listening take, to Maybe YouTube. takes time. Is the we're counting on it, and then someone in the is the cable connected type. This is a friendly group, so we don't have be okay. The librarian said that the connection gets loose, the uh, cable oh. gets okay. loose. Yeah. No, but it's a Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is oh. not. Oh, no. okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turns out we can't watch those short videos. Oh, that's Unless the HFC is again. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, we'll skip the short video and move on. So brain matter is the tissue or material that makes up most of our brain. It is associated with intelligence and decision making. 
A brain scan experiment from Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry within Germany has shown that viewing porn over time may lead to a decrease of brain matter, which causes the brain to get smaller. This affects our ability to make good choices. A neurosurgeon by the name of Dr. Donald Hilton from the University of Texas discovered that porn impairs the frontal lobe of our brain. The frontal lobe of our brain is the largest section of our brain and is located at the front. It is in charge of our personality, intelligence, short-term memory, impulsivity, and decision-making, including our morals. Studies have already proven that watching even small amounts of porn is enough to affect our frontal lobes, which in turn may lead to forgetfulness and a higher risk of making poor choices. Porn addiction is a very large topic within the anti-porn movement. Several years ago, Statistics and empirical evidence shown that the average age of first exposure to porn was 12 years old. Now it drops to as young as 9 or 10 years old. Now this may be a shocker for many of you, but in some cases, kids such as myself were first exposed to porn at a much earlier age. I can still remember clearly to this day the first porn I saw, which was on TV, when I was 4 years old. forever burns in my mind, and from then on throughout my childhood years, I was hooked onto porn, especially by the time I was nine years old, and had unsupervised access to the internet. At that time, my parents were too busy with work, and my brothers were too busy with their own lives to supervise me. My parents would tell me not to watch these bad pictures, but they never gave me a reason why I shouldn't be watching them. So throughout most of my life, I grew up thinking porn is overall harmless. I mean, why is it okay for adults to watch it to the not kids? They are just pictures after all, so what's the harm? One day I was playing an online Japanese animated dress up game, but I had no idea it was one of those adult games where the character can be shown completely nude and react to clips on certain parts of its body. Antai, which means pervert in Japanese, and is known as anime or Japanese cartoon porn within Western culture, was a gateway to my internet porn addiction. After playing that first video game, I wasn't able to stop playing more of these games. Hours went by, then it became days, weeks. I ended up spending a lot of time playing all these games on that one website. There was no more of these games on that website I haven't tried yet. So I decided to Google for more of these games. Besides introducing these games and videos to a few other kids, such as my close friends, or friends online, my porn use was kept in secret, out of shame, especially as I'm a female, and many wouldn't suspect that I would ever do such a thing. Little did I know I was severely addicted to porn until I was 20 years old, which was a few years ago, and found out about this anti-porn movement online called Fight the New Drug. That's where I got this shirt and street team goodies from, which I don't have here, unfortunately. <laughs> which is part of a large prize I won from doing simple activities on their smartphone apps. And if you're wondering what the app is called, it's called Fighter App. It's appropriate for all ages, especially teenagers and older. The consequences of porn addiction is it may lead to larger impairments of the brain because of the frequent use and get so bad to the point of porn erectile dysfunction, where the person can still be sexually aroused by pornographic images, but can no longer stay sexually aroused with a real person. This has a huge damaging impact on relationships and marriages. All those hours spent filling one's mind with this junk, instead of studying, may also lead to huge decrease within a student's performance in school, which actually happened within my high school grades and first year of college. In this technological age, porn addiction is a pandemic that's on the rise, especially among young generations. On the bright side, because the brain is neuroplastic, mm. as in it's constantly changing, if a person quits viewing porn, then the brain will heal over a period of time. So we're not doomed. Oh, not, how long, you know? Um, 
Depending on how frequently the person viewed porn, it may take three months or even one year until full recovery. I see. Where the brain returns back to its original state. Mm. And in some cases, it may take a few years. Mm. Porn's effect on relationships or effect on the heart is the next factor I'll be talking about. So, who here recognizes this biblical quote? Yes? Yeah. What is, yeah, can common. you say that again? Uh, you, you um, know this. Who recognizes this biblical quote? Oh. Oh. Okay. oh, yeah. This is a pretty popular quote. Did I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart? Matthew 5, 28. Anyone care to explain what this quote means? Somebody asked and me. <laughs> Go ahead. Somebody yeah, simple, no. right? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can explain it. Um, so back then, adultery means cheating on one's spouse or being involved in sexual relationships with another person's spouse. But nowadays, since marriages are less common and more people no longer get married as early as they used to, the modern day version of adultery would be cheating on one's partner either a spouse, a boyfriend, or girlfriend. So in terms of dating and relationships, Christians and non-Christians who hold strong moral values would place heavy emphasis on monogamy. Mono stands for one, so in monogamous relationships or marriages, a person's sexual and romantic desire is for one partner and only one partner. More than one romantic and sexual partner would be considered polygamous. And if there is no romance involved, but several sexual partners at once, that would be considered polysexual. So oftentimes people mix up polygamy and polysexuality. Recently, online a new term came out, pornosexual. So similar to polysexual, instead of having multiples of sex partners in person, it involves multiples of sex, sex partners within images or on screen. Those who are pornosexual often have porn-induced erectile dysfunction as they can no longer stay aroused by a real person, yet are still aroused by pornography. The more frequently a person views porn, the more likely they will become a pornosexual. The reason for this is because when a person is getting their sexual pleasures from porn, the love chemicals in their brain are bonding to these images they are seeing. So really, it's not much different than being sexually involved with a real person. The only difference is there isn't physical intimacy between two people or between more than two people for some relationships. Um, there is a sexual bonding between human and pixels though. This ruins the intimate connection between human beings, which is why the quote, porn kills love is a common mantra within Fight the New Job. And hopefully this next video will be good. where they show the three um, major topics on how porn impacts. Um, I'm trying to look for the video here. Okay. Click OK. I will now talk about this woman's experience on how porn damaged her relationship. She was in a relationship with a man for several of years. Her boyfriend would watch a lot of violent mainstream porn, showing acts of girls and women being tied up beaten, choked, slapped, 
and degraded by men. What he visually consumed influenced his sexuality. He would act out what he watched on his girlfriend, and she would end up with wounds, scars, and bruises because of that. He would even criticize her body for not looking like the female performers within the videos and called her derogatory names, such as fat, ugly, and whore. Hmm. At one point during sex, he physically abused her so bad to the point where she ended up in the hospital. Hmm. After that, she broke up with him, and a few years later, he committed suicide. Now there are many other relationships or marriages, cases that are similar to this, though perhaps not as bad. So for instance, back in early 2015, I lost my first and former relationship due to my ex-boyfriend's poor needs. He used to be more loving and his standards were realistic until after I introduced to him some online anti-mangas, which are Japanese comic books. This was before I found out about the anti-porn movement and was still on the neutral fence in terms of pornography. His mind got really hooked on the images and sexual acts of these pornographic visuals to the point where he no longer viewed me as physically attractive as his physical and, and sexual ideal standards changed. He even told me multiples of times in the beginning that he is strictly monogamous and that I'm 100% physically ideal to him. So therefore, he had no eyes for other women besides me. I thought that sounded too good to be true. But because I wanted to peacefully progress in a relationship, I decided to trust him on that. But turns out he isn't so monogamous after all, as he was watching porn of other female bodies behind, behind my back many times. I felt very betrayed and felt disgust, not only towards him, but also towards myself for having to trust that he's fully committed towards me in the first place. Earlier in the relationship, we never had an actual discussion in terms of porn. So even after I became anti-porn and found out he was viewing porn of, or, so even before I became anti-porn and found out he was viewing porn of other female bodies behind my back, I felt a sharp emotional pain of betrayal. He made a promise himself which the first time I didn't ask him to, that he would never watch porn again for the rest of his life. Of course, it was too good to be true, because each time after our temporary breakups, he would go back to watching porn involving other female bodies again. He would used to have a wallpaper of my face on his computer desktop, but eventually one day he got an extra monitor and changed the wallpaper to a picture of a female anime character whose body proportions are unrealistic and looks absolutely nothing like mine. He even made a tasteless joke that those two females are accompanying him. Yeah, not so monogamous after all. He also had a picture of a hypersexualized female anime character in a skimpy bikini from a music video as a wallpaper on his cell phone. That character in the music video represented lust and addiction because the music video was based on a boy's addiction to um, Japanese cartoons or animation. And with that, there was also uh, some type of sexual addiction as well. That character in the music video represented lost addiction. So I begged him to remove that wallpaper because it was really bothering me, especially the fact that he knows I'm not okay with him sexually desiring other female bodies, especially the ones that look absolutely nothing like mine. I was also concerned that kids or other people in the bus would see the softcore pornographic image. Sadly and frustratingly, he refused to change the wallpapers until a few months later. But eventually, they would be wallpapers featuring another female anime character. Having to deal with all of that, including my trust for him, which he violated, my grades were slipping so much to the point where I decided to give him an ultimatum. Either choose me, a real woman, or those hypersexualized fictional female anime characters. As it was predicted, okay, uh, take a <laughs> sip of water. So as he, as it was predicted, he chose fictional and we had our last breakup. Ever since then, I have a negative outlook on real love for myself, especially in this day and age, where almost every male out there have already been exposed to porn and the majority of them intentionally doing it. I had visions that one day I would marry my first love and 
have a happy family with him. But I guess not all dreams come true, especially as we live in a fallen world full of evil and wicked temptations. To this day, I am still dealing with the trauma, although slowly it's getting better and fighting against porn is a way for me to heal from all that. Often males who had earlier long exposure to porn would complain or deep down feel disappointed that their partner or real woman don't measure up to the fictional female's feature in porn. One day, I found out about Fight the New Drug on Facebook through someone's comment promoting it on a Facebook page. The person posts a link with a picture that says, Porn kills love. It made me curious, especially as my relationship was struggling due to my partner's pornness. Surprisingly, American and Australian marital court statistics have shown that more than half of current divorces happen due to a partner's porn obsession. A Bible studies friend of mine, John over here, has a friend who works as a pastor and was also a counselor for relationships and marriages. His friend swore that about 92%, 92% of the relationship and marriage cases he has dealt with didn't have anything to do with financial struggles, but rather it has to do with a partner or spouse's poor needs. 92% is a really high number that is close to 100%. It is evident that ever since poor abuse became common within our society, relationships, marriages, families, self-esteem, and even our sexuality are tearing apart, especially amongst the young generations. Now for the last factor on how porn affects the world. I actually typed up all of the script last minute, so up to this point, um, up to this point, because I, I didn't have enough time to complete it. <laughs> so now I'll be improvising. <laughs> Sorry, Hilda. Please bear with me. Okay, so this quote here says, I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. Psalm 101.3. So would anyone here like to interpret this quote? Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> go, Christine. You want to go? John. Give it a try. <laughs> Actually, I don't know the word. Bad things. So I can actually explain this quote. Um, vile is, um, it means something that's disgusting or repulsive. So, um, Nowadays, we live in a generation um, where we're becoming more liberal-minded and um, godly principles are becoming a thing of the past. Um, and so, we're constantly surrounded by negative temptations um, in our daily lives. And um, as I mentioned earlier, software porn is literally almost everywhere. Um, it's in advertisements, movies, so basically, we're living um, in a fortified culture. Yeah, so that's the term for it. Because the culture we're living in right now is saturated full of porn. Um, like, say, for instance, the Kim Kardashian families. Yeah, they definitely have a lot of um, sexually explicit videos and pictures. And also in music videos, um, a lot of kids watch these music videos, and they get heavily influenced by them. And also there is male violence, which is very common within mainstream porn, as the products are girls and women, typically. And the men um, that are usually using, um, the, sorry, the people that are usually using these girls and women happen to be men. So, there's supposed to be a video here. But Hopefully this video works. <laughs> and it's on a different website. Yeah. I didn't know the internet connection. 
it would be this awful. Yeah, we didn't know. Last time we didn't have an internet connection, right? No, we didn't use it last didn't time. Use but anything. when I used it, it, it worked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It worked for videos? No, yeah, last time we, you know, we had a seminars oh, yeah. we could use. Whether we're on Wi-Fi, there is no such thing. Internet safe. Mm -hmm. Libraries automatically get on my phone too. Remember, Mary connected it. Yeah, Marie was here. I thought she fixed it. I thought you could look at a sign signal that says whether you're no, connected or not. Computer much more Yes. Hi. It is connected, right? But she said you were to look at your connected or... Actually, it's working now. Oh, yeah, I just have to exit the PowerPoint. Oh, PowerPoint that's good. Good. Oh. Hopefully, it doesn't need to work. Oh, okay. You can't go. It's <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, close it. Should we turn off the light? Yeah. My name is John Fobert. I'm a professor of higher education and student affairs at Oklahoma State University. And I also lead a national nonprofit organization called One in Four, which has worked since 1998 to end sexual violence on college campuses and in the military. How is pornography harming our society at large? From 2008 to 2011, exposure among kids under 13 uh, to pornography went from 14% to 49%. Okay, just in those three years, well, what's a big thing that happened? The ubiquity of the smartphone. There, there's no question that this generation has more access to pornography than anyone in human history ever. How do we describe to people why pornography and violence go together? Pornography is a recipe for rape. And I'm not saying that anytime someone uses pornography, they're going to commit rape. Um, but what it essentially teaches people is that you're supposed to be violent when you're intimate with somebody. There was a study that came out of the University of Arkansas and NYU showing that 88% of scenes in porn movies include violence by one person towards another, usually a man towards a woman. But what I found most interesting about that research is that when someone hits another person in porn, 95% of the time they respond with either pleasure or they have no response at all. So it's teaching this generation that sex and violence are intertwined. The most interesting study I read most recently is one that did brain scans of men while they were watching pornography. They scanned their brains and they wanted to see what areas of the brain light up when men look at porn. It's the part of the brain that deals with objects, not people. But the more we dehumanize someone, the more possible it is to commit violence against them. And that's what porn does. I study pornography as a scholar. I look at its impact. And one of the things that frustrates me is people who will say things are in the research that aren't, or they'll question solid research just because it doesn't fit their own opinion. And what they say is the connection between pornography and sexual violence is merely assumed. Well, we have over 50 studies showing a direct link between pornography and sexual violence. And from statistical odds, here's what we know. The odds that the pro-porn side says there's no connection, the odds that they're right is like this. You take the Empire State Building in New York City, a real big building, you fill it with pennies. And then you take that and you make a billion Empire State Buildings filled with pennies. The odds that this pro-porn side is right is that you pick the right Empire State Building out of a billion of them. You go to the right floor and you pick out that right penny. That one penny represents statistically the likelihood that the pro-porn side is correct. That really there's no connection between porn and sexual violence. The odd that they're right is one in one decillion. This generation is being taught sex and violence go together, 
Um, I do have hope, though, that we can unteach that. It's just we have a lot of work to do. Dr. Mary Ann Layden. She's a psychotherapist and director of education at the Center for Cognitive Therapy from the University of Pennsylvania, which is within the U.S. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Layden. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a cognitive therapist, which just means that I'm interested in what people believe because I think what you believe controls your behavior and emotions. I look at the negative end, what causes people to have psychological problems, but I look at the positive end too, what makes for good quality of life. We recognize there, there are probably two main factors that give life its biggest meanings. It's love and work. When we want to go into work, we have a lot of role models that show us how to go to work. We have a lot of courses to take on what to do, to learn. So we have a lot of experience with work. But when it comes to love, where do we learn it? Pornography rushes in and makes that place available. In many ways, pornography is the perfect teaching tool, except for the fact that everything it teaches you is a lie. So across the board, it's going to be teaching you things that will destroy this most important aspect of your life. It will do it in a way that becomes insidious, where you may not even notice that it's doing it, teaching you attitudes and behaviors and emotions and expecting certain things from partners that are absolutely toxic and destructive. I have done some research myself. So one of the things we did is we asked college students um, first, how much pornography they used, and then we looked at what that was connected with. Now, some of the things are not a surprise. We found that the earlier the male students began to use pornography, the more likely they were as young adults to have committed some act of non-consenting sex. We looked at some of the males who had prostituted women and had, were users of pornography, and we asked them why they did it. And we also looked at the males who didn't use pornography and had never prostituted a woman, and we asked them why they didn't do it. The males who were using pornography and had prostituted a woman, when we asked them why, they said, because sex is not an intimate act. And the ones who said, I don't prostitute women, said the reason they didn't was because sex was an intimate act. Clearly, the message in pornography is that sex is not about intimacy in any particular we also have now begun to see the damage um, that can show up in the research on the porn users themselves. Pornography was telling you you're going to have a great sex life, and yet what it's producing is sexual dysfunction. So we see in some of the research that almost 60% of the young males, average age about 25, have sexual dysfunction if they're using pornography only when they're with real people, but not when they're using the pornography. So what we've done is we've debilitated them in the ability to, to be sexual with a person. It takes them down the rabbit hole into these extreme kinds of behaviors, starting with an attitude, starting with a permission-giving belief that says this is okay, and starting with the belief that seeing pornography is okay, and then all the messages of pornography, all the teaching of relationship that pornography does is also okay, and all the corollary behaviors that come with it. You know, pornography is sexual fast food. And there's a feast out there. And I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. 
and the pornography is a fake version. And I want you to have the real version. <laughs> it's fake. <laughs> and so get the real kind. Get the real kind. connected to sex trafficking or prostitution because as I mentioned earlier pornography is basically film prostitution so it makes sense that um, that girls and women uh, a lot of them are actually sexually trafficked into porn as that's modern day prostitution and um, yeah it's very unfortunate it's still going on today and it's widespread And she deals, um, she's the founding executive director for the Center uh, for Combating Human Trafficking, which is in Wichita State University. And yeah, she has more than two decades of personal professional practice uh, within sex trafficking and its connections to pornography. My name is Dr. Karen Countryman Roseworm. I'm a master level social worker and I have my PhD in psychology. I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for Combating Human Trafficking at Wichita State University. And our mission is ultimately to help build the capacity of our country, of this world, to respond to the issue of sexual exploitation. The focus of our work really began just because we were seeing so many of the runaway and homeless youth that we were working with, that they were being sexually exploited through what we now call uh, domestic minor sex trafficking. We have worked for over 10 years to develop a domestic sex trafficking risk and resilience assessment, and that's gone through multiple layers of validation. We asked 258 young people the questions, number one, what do you feel put you at risk for sex trafficking? And then number two, what do you feel helped you get out of that experience of sex trafficking? What we were surprised to find is how there was a link between pornography and their risk for sex trafficking. Working with those who have been sex trafficked, we already knew that pornography was a part of the experience while they were being sex trafficked. What is most interesting, though, is to see that pornography is a common thread. So pornography is a risk factor. And then pornography, once they enter into a situation of sex trafficking and through force, fraud, or coercion, pornography was used as a means to normalize, to desensitize them to the sexual acts that they would experience, as well as pornography was oftentimes used as some sort of advertising for um, their sexual abuse. So through different modes of pornography that they would be filmed and that they would be used and they would be advertised for the various acts that could be done to them that they could um, be engaged in and it was it was rape on camera we really see the issue of trafficking on a continuum of violence from pornography 
to sex trafficking. All these issues are connected, and again, it's on that continuum of violence. The images that occur within pornography actually encourage and, and promote and normalize that people want violence during sex. So it is rare to see a pornographic image, to watch any sort of pornographic video in this day and age that does not include violence. And so what it communicates is people like to get hit, people like to get hurt, and these, these, these faces, these images of terror become a norm. All these issues are connected, and again, it's on that continuum of violence. So pornography absolutely perpetuates abuse. It, it perpetuates human trafficking. It dehumanizes people, and we know that we're always looking for numbers in our country. What is the percentage of people that are affected by this or that, specifically sexual exploitation, human trafficking? And I think that understanding the numbers and the extent to which this affects our population is important, and yet at the same time, I believe that one person exploited is one too many. Well, that was based on human sex trafficking and connections to pornography. And if you'd like to find out um, more about this research, you can check out truthaboutporn.org. There's plenty of research there being constantly updated. The upper one, upper one, that one, yeah. I have to wait. <laughs> so any questions so far while we wait? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a comment, you know, uh, our pastor from Montreal, Reverend Frank Famuraro, he was about, he interviewed all the candidates for the marriage, blessing marriage, and he, as of now he did like more than ten people, both male and female, and according to him, all the candidates are suffering with this issue, all of them. Male and females. <clears throat> because they have cell phone, right? They can do whatever they want. Yeah, they can just take it anywhere they want with them. They can access pornography anytime, mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. Much different than decades ago when pornography used to be more featured in magazines, like magazines, mm -hmm. or books. Totally With all this research and evidence, is there any pushback on the pornographic industry illegally, wise, anywhere? Um, well, so far, um, there's a couple of states in the U.S. that are declaring porn a public I heard crisis. Utah was one, right? Yeah, Utah's one of them. Yeah. And Utah's the first one to declare. Yeah. And um, one of my fellow anti-porn activist friend, um, she's she used to be a porn actress, and she used to recruit girls into the porn industry. Nowadays, she's a passionate speaker um, fighting against pornography, and she's trying to help uh, with this Human Trafficking um, Prevention Act. Um, the resolution in the bill uh, meant to uh, declare pornography a public health crisis and to filter porn on websites, so that way kids would have um, harder access these materials. But very difficult to get that stuff through, isn't it? Yeah, it There's is, because it's a back. long process through the government. It has to pass through um, the House, and then it has to pass through the Senate, and then it can be officially declared. Yeah, so it, it takes patience. But um, so far, there's a couple of states that have already passed the resolution bill. Um, there's South Dakota that passed it, uh, Virginia, um, Kansas, Arkansas. 
and there's a few upcoming ones. So, yeah, so we're definitely fighting to make this happen. And um, we usually do this by calling the representative's office and asking them to push forward the bill and resolution, and also sending emails after testimonies and support in support of the resolution bill. So there's a um, there's a letter that anybody can uh, can um, send to the an MP or uh, the um, member of parliament. Well, there is um, an act or resolution um, document yeah. um, that are sent to the government or in the offices, yeah. and then um, this. The representatives would view these documents, and then they'll pass them over on to the high ups. Um, so, um, but um, like in religious organizations, are they working with that resolution, like to? Yeah, um, there's different organizations working all together to make this resolution happen. Yeah. Yes. So we're trying to gather as many people as possible um, to support the bill and resolution, so we can get more sponsors to push these bills forward. But is, uh, is there one letter like that anybody can, can anybody do that, individuals as well? Um, well, a person can file in these documents or these acts um, mm -hmm. at the office, and then they would need sponsors to help the representatives um, bring these bills up, otherwise they'll just be pushed back in the back burner in the oh, process. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very important um, to have as many sponsors as possible and many people backing up these bills and resolutions. So like a lot of the Christian churches would be doing that, right? They'd be... Yeah, some of them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I've been asking um, Reverend Kambashi um, if he knows anyone from certain states within the U.S. who can help out with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can help sponsor the bills and resolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's an official website for that. So this is the legislation aspect of the anti fraud movement. So it's a very huge deal. descriptions and videos what the trafficking act mm -hmm. has, um, like what it tells, what it does. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. but yeah, um, there's a list of representatives per state um, who are sponsoring these bills and resolutions. Is that the number of the bill of resolution? Yeah, the, the differs in each state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it is like a United States, like a like kind of a kind of border to organize and some United States are more active, right? In Canada, how about Canada? Um, Activist. In Canada, we actually already had another kind of bill passed recently, last year in July. Um, by Arnold Bearson, and he's a representative from Edmonton, Alberta. Mm -hmm. He passed a bill um, on Motion 47, and it's to study the negative impacts or harms of pornography. And that's going to be finished within July or so. Yeah, this July. How about the international connection to organize this kind of... The international? Because it's this problem is not like only North America. Like, uh, yeah, like in Europe and Asia. Uh, yeah, like kind of uh, some kind of uh, some people uh, get the more information from other countries and together more make a uh, impact <coughs> to influence people worldwide. Yeah. 
So there are small anti-farm movements scattered around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right now, we're mostly focusing on awareness and education mm -hmm. because there are so many people who aren't aware of the scientific and empirical impacts of pornography. So in order to create change, awareness is the first step. I a, can I have a question? Yeah. Now I believe you are the only student, I think, who is wearing this t-shirt in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, you have friends and uh, families, and uh, I believe you have difficulties to, you know, if you talk with them about this issue. So what is the most difficult part to promote your anti-porn activities? That would be facing opposition because there are some neutrals and pro porners out there um, who actually defend pornography. Um, in the name of freedom? Yeah, in the name mm, of freedom. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, um, like, is freedom uh, more important than the well being and health of our younger generations and our families? So, like, um, yeah, I place heavy importance on the well-being of everyone as a whole, um, and marriages and families as well, because that's a big deal in our society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if these roots are um, constantly being contaminated by pornography or other negative influences, um, eventually everything just, it just breaks apart, and um, it can really have a huge impact on our society. Yeah. So this is something that a lot of pro-porners aren't very much well aware about, yeah, because they're so focused on uh, freedom uh, and empowerment in the wrong ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's um, feminists, like a group of feminists, for example. Um, they're called liberal feminists, and they call themselves sex positive feminists. Mm -hmm. They actually promote pornography because they think it's, it empowers women mm -hmm. and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they think that. Um, it makes women more comfortable in their sexuality, um, even if they like, display their bodies. But I, it's something that um, I don't support, personally, because it actually furthers um, the promotion that women are sex objects. And it further reduces them into that. So yeah, there's another group of feminists out there called radical feminists. And they're actually anti-sexploitation, or anti-sexual exploitation. So they're anti-pornography for the most part. Um, and radical doesn't mean extremist for radical feminism, it means root. So they want to deal with the root problems within our society and um, overcome them. Yeah, such as um, the problem of how our society is, it's mostly male dominated. So that's why in the porn industry it's mostly females that are the products or commodities so they definitely um, want to change that. And yeah, this is the legislation website. So radical feminists are pushing for a more safer world for girls and women because pornography oftentimes promotes sexual violence. And they also are pushing for a healthy sexuality because nowadays um, most of the young generations are getting their sexual education from pornography. And you call them radical feminists? That's yeah, radical feminism. Yeah. Is that because pornography and this kind of dehumanization of sex is so normalized that you probably have to be a kind of a radical outside of the norm mm -hmm. yeah. to mm -hmm. promote mm -hmm. something? Decent and good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but, um, yeah. The the root word for radical, like in their terms, um, it just means like to actually grasp by the roots mm -hmm. and create change from there, mm -hmm. from the bottom up. Yeah. Also, not only the like uh, other group, like uh, they become uh, very abnormal, like children. They can become uh, like uh, so many children are uh, used for the pornography, right? 
This is a very criminal. Yeah, this is this a really basically exploiting children. Yeah, that is a really, really kind of mm -hmm. sickening. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's I can't understand why people become like that. Kind yeah. of. It's scary, right? More and there's more. laws against it, but it just seems like it's allowed to happen. There's not much will to stop it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We live in a very contradictive society, contradictive laws. Mm -hmm. yeah. Follow the money. Yeah. Yeah, because um, the porn industry is a multi billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of corporations are benefiting from this because they partner out with these industries. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised if the government is actually involved with it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they're making some kind of profit. Yeah, otherwise they would have banned pornography like long ago already. And it's yeah. connected to other things like um, uh, crime and human trafficking, prostitution, you know, criminal cartels. It goes from money to power in, in, in this side of things, in the bad side of things. It's yeah. very powerful, very big. And it's, in, and it's gone over and it seems to be influencing the good side of the infiltrating over the last 40, 50 years. So there's very little stronghold in for what you're doing, yeah. but it's growing and it, I think, it has to. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, the anti porn movement, um, it actually started way back in the 1980s by radical feminists. Oh, and really? they would actually protest on the streets. They would hold these large signs um, fighting against pornography and sexual exploitation. But um, one of one of the feminist radical feminists named Andrea Dorkin, she's a very well known radical feminist back then. She tried to contact the government um, to reduce prostitution, like make it much more safer for um, the sex performers and uh, or sex workers. Radical feminists don't use the term sex workers because um, they wouldn't really consider it work or so like slavery. <laughs> due to lack of choices for these women. And um, yeah, so she tried to get the government on her side, um, on the girls and women's side for their safety as well. But the government kind of refused um, because they didn't really take this whole pornography issue seriously. And so it was um, hidden in the back burner for decades until now, until around 2009 or so, when new research on pornography was discovered. So um, each year, there's new anti-porn movements and organizations showing up. Yeah, so it's definitely growing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the first time I joined Fight the New Drug, the Facebook page was about 250,000 likes and followers. And now there's well over a million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're definitely gaining attraction and momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another um, huge deal with pornography is internet safety. So here's another quote. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman in Job 31 1. Um, so it's pretty uh, self explanatory what this quote means. Well, it's basically self control from these temptations. And um, in terms of kids using the internet, parental supervision is very important um, because, well, like when I was nine years old, I wasn't really supervised. Um, and so it can lead to porn addiction and kids um, learning a lot about these things from porn videos. And normally parents don't talk about pornography with their kids because it's a really awkward topic. Um, they're not exactly sure how to start it out with their kids. And so, yeah, it's, it's a hidden growing issue. Yeah. So it's kind of venomous like a snake. And there are internet filters, which you can download for free online or um, at a decent price from certain websites. So this would be one example of an internet filter for movies mostly and films. Movie directors say new is about art. But then, why are women nude in movies three times as much as men? Or in Game of Thrones, six times as much? That doesn't seem like art, unless art is the name of a gross gym teacher. 
So, is Hollywood bad for your kids? One, female nudity and objectification. Hollywood often uses nudity to turn women into sex objects, which is a big problem since studies show women are people. But since producers know that breasts and butts fill up theaters, they use women's naked bodies as advertisements. Just look at all the movie posters that show a woman's body, but not her face. Unless a woman is Bigfoot or Sia, you should be able to photograph her face. The problem is, Hollywood makes bank by pornographying women. Just listen to why this director added female nudity to a Game of Thrones episode. And then this particular exec like, took me one side and said, look, I represent the pervert side of the audience. Okay? <laughs> Everybody else is a serious drama side, I represent the perv side of the audience, and I want full from full nudity in this scene, so you go ahead and do it. Gross. First off, pervs don't need representation in Hollywood. They already have it in Congress. And second off, every time Hollywood makes money by saying women are sex objects, they send that message straight to our kids. Two, murder and violence. By 18, the average child has seen 16,000 murders on movies or TV. And if you show a child something depraved and immoral 16,000 times, it's gonna start seeming normal. That's how we got the Teletubbies. In fact, multiple studies link violent media consumption to increased aggression, including later criminal activity and spousal abuse. And when violence is mixed with sex, things get scarier. How many times does Hollywood depict not just gratuitous scenes of rape, but also scenes where it's the good guy forcing himself on a woman? Each of those scenes tells our sons that no actually means yes. And if you're expecting a joke here, the joke is on society. Look, Hollywood as an industry has serious issues with sexual harassment, assault, and even child sex abuse. So we probably shouldn't let them decide what normal sexuality looks like. They don't even know what Asians look like. Three, profanity and bigotry. Movies can expose your kids to words you don't want them to hear, like cussing, profanity, racist, sexist, and homophobic slurs. Between 1950 and 2010, adult language in films increased 800%. So you're probably kicking yourself for investing in real estate and not the F word. And yes, when it comes to adult language, your kids are gonna hear it eventually. But why not protect their innocence a little longer? Which is also our philosophy with Smash Mouth. Look, if aliens saw Earth only through our movies, they might think it's a world where men are murderers, women are sex objects, and bigoted, profane language is the norm. And the thing is, we do show these movies to the planet's newcomers. They're called kids. That's why we made VidAngel. VidAngel is a streaming app that lets you watch movies and shows and skip whatever sex, violence, or language you don't want to see. And since every family's different, VidAngel lets you customize movies for your specific needs. Now, religious viewers can remove the Lord's name in vain. Trauma survivors can take out trigger scenes, and parents with young kids can cut scary moments instead of cutting a check for future therapy. Looking at you, Fern Gully. VidAngel gives you total peace of mind. It now connects to your streaming accounts like Netflix, Amazon, and HBO, and lets you filter the content you're already paying for. And when a new episode comes out, you can watch it filtered 24 hours later on any major device. All for just $7.99 a month, the cost of a pizza. And the first month costs nothing, like a stolen pizza. So if you want to protect your kids from murder, nudity, or Jar Jar Binks, go to vidangel.com or the App Store to start your free month today. Yeah, we have a Jar Jar filter. Don't like censorship? Neither do we. We don't force directors to change their scenes. We just let families mute and skip those scenes like they would with a remote. A remote isn't censorship. It's choice. And sure. If you think filtering ruins the art or don't want to give money to a movie that needs filtering, VidAngel's probably not for you, and we respect that. But if skipping that one scene will make your movie night perfect, VidAngel is for you, and we respect that more because you're paying us. Hollywood makes incredible movies and shows, but some parts may be inappropriate for your family. Now you can filter them with VidAngel. Well, VidAngel is one of those um, organizations or companies where you can have the option to filter Inappropriate scenes, um, movies, and films. One-time payments, like eight dollars a month, month free. Month, 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 month. Month. The first month is free. Oh, I see. <laughs> Why don't they make it free? No, no, no. Just Why don't for they a make month. It free? Only first month first free. Month. Only first month. Yeah. 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 And they're actually really good for even adult porn addicts too, not just children. Because mm -hmm. um, certain material can actually trigger their addiction. Um, and um, 
Yeah, this is a very, very dark issue uh, in terms of pornography. It's revenge porn. And um, because a lot of kids are getting their influences from porn, um, like some kids as young as 12 or 13 years old, uh, some of these girls are actually taking nude pictures of themselves or recording themselves and posting them on the internet for other people to see, particularly boys. And um, uh, have you guys ever heard of Amanda Todd? Amanda Todd? Yeah. I've heard the name. So Amanda Todd um, was a girl who was about 14 years old. Mm. And she was using the internet one day, chatting with a stranger. And that stranger asked her um, to show her breasts. Mm -hmm. And she, at first she refused to. But the, um, the person that she was talking to online, it turns out that he was a hacker or something like that. So he um, pressured her to finally show her breasts. And he actually saved the pictures of that. And then um, he later on uh, pressured her again. And this time he told her if she doesn't show more of her, her bodies, then her body parts, then she'll, or then he'll um, blackmail her. Yeah. So uh, eventually um, one day um, her pictures got leaked out um, on the internet and her peers like her classmates, for instance, they saw the pictures. And when she found out about that, she, she freaked out a lot. Yeah, so her, her reputation was being bad. She was being constantly bullied every day. And um, eventually she decided to drink bleach. And she ended up in the hospital. And then um, after that, she was still facing um, people harassing her and bullying her. And then finally one day, she actually committed suicide. And her story was it's well known throughout Canada. She's also a Canadian citizen. Yeah. So it's really unfortunate that revenge porn is actually a pretty common thing amongst teenagers and preteens nowadays. And um, basically girls are trying to emulate these porn actresses or what they see on TV or on Instagram. And it's, it's just really sad. Um, it's, it's dangerous too. It's kind of scary to think about it because I'm sure most of you here have children. And um, yeah, that's why it's very important to talk about pornography with our kids. And um, I was going to mention that in Hollywood, um, there's this film called Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm sure most of you know that, right? Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. You add a loop again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So originally it was um, an erotica novel. And, um, yes, yeah, someone's standing there. It's an erotica novel. And basically it turned into a movie. And it's pretty much kind of a pornographic movie because there are sex scenes in them. And even teenage kids are watching these movies and reading these books. And um, in these books, <laughs> or in this movie, it features male violence. So it's like a distorted version of BDSM, where they tie up the woman and like, they, they abuse her physically. And um, yeah, in these books and movies, they try to normalize that, the sexual abuse on women and girls. And so a lot of men and boys nowadays are getting their ideas from these films. And then they expect their partner to be willing to join them in mm -hmm. doing these acts and activities. And in some cases, um, there was this boy, he was 16 years old. After he watched Fifty Shades of Grey, he tried to rape another girl. Mm -hmm. Like he tried to rape a girl who was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And he tried to do all these acts on her, so he tied her up. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, fortunately, he got caught uh, because she kind of fought her way. And this movie still plays, or show, whatever it is? Yeah, there's actually a second sequel in it. <laughs> yeah. It wants to show how <laughs> our society works. Oh kind of too. Yeah, so it's very normalized. Like a lot of women are reading these books and watching these things. So it has a pretty large fan base, mm -hmm. kind of like Harry Potter almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's very unfortunate. Uh, but on the bright side, there are um, a lot of feminists, like the, the radical feminists who are trying to push back and fight against that mm -hmm. because they don't want sexual abuse and girls and women to be normal. Pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
someday you need to meet my daughter. She's very passionate about this subject. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Is she a feminist or anti-feminist? Well, you might say that, but uh, not, not in the Lenin no, sense, I guess. Yeah. Maybe in this more radical sense. <laughs> but she goes to school and has no time. And it's amazing you do this and you're going to school, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm currently, I'm taking the summer off, but I'm going to be working full-time. Yeah, well, hopefully someday you'll meet her. You can chat about such things. She, she's going to Douglas College right now. Yeah, definitely you can chat with her. I'm very interested in that um, because there's no local anti-poor movements here. And there's no None? local anti-poor Zero? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Not in all of Vancouver. All Say Vancouver? Oh my god. No, no. Yeah, recruit my daughter. She's a good <laughs> She's strong. Yeah. Yeah. And then an even more powerful husband and wife to speak. Oh, that. right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think overall, of course, we say we have women abused and all that through history, etc. And now again, in that sense, particularly, but then really see more than, than, than demonize too much men only, because I think we're coming to, to the point that many women are actually in school situation, I see even 10 years old, 12 years, very aggressive toward boys, right? Yeah. So it's this really unbalanced situation that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but there is a reason, and obviously I think Satan is trying to destroy our societies all over the world, right? Yeah. Yeah, so awesome. most people don't know what right and wrong anymore almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Feminists give up the fight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's. Um, I think. Well, it's, it's mostly due to corrupt corporations. Like um, radical feminists also try to fight or push back against corrupt capitalism because it actually promotes um, prostitution, foreign strip clubs, um, using females as commodities, and selling them. Yeah. So um, corrupt capitalism has a lot to do. With that's why pornography is still existent and widespread. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, some people would say uh, sexual problems started with Adam and Eve, right? That was no that kind of big government uh, uh, situation yet, right? right? So almost like some people accept, oh, this is just how it's going to be. Almost we can do. I think we need to more work on on a grassroots level with families, people who are really feeling that this is a they calling. And because if we start attacking the big corporations, I think overall it's gonna be just too complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so yeah. we can't just yeah. attack it head on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very important to gather as many people as possible to yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I was surprised when my, um, my son was two years old. No, no, no. Grade two. Grade <laughs> 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 two. Oh my gosh. Grade <laughs> <laughs> two. Seven years We had a parents' meeting, mm -hmm. and then the sex education. Mm -hmm. the, I was wondering what, what mm -hmm. is this yeah. uh, talk about for the two, grade two. Yeah, that I important. attended, and uh, the nurse came and it brought a door. Mm -hmm. And this is men, this is women, and they go to bed and they have sex. This kind of teaching they did, and I was so shocked. <laughs> but it was not only me. A worldwide agenda coming from the United Nations. Gosh. Yeah. If you look deep enough, you can find it. Like the agenda of 21 or something. Yeah. In the name of human rights. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I had some issues, but now everybody has the same thing kind of thing, right? Yeah. They want to normalize all No standard. Right? No, no father, no mother. Yeah. It, 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 it's really kind of dark. Yeah. And and when people are vulnerable, when like people become vulnerable to mm -hmm. these things, well, and then sure. so they make more money off people who are vulnerable too, like the, uh, those in control. They want to keep it's people. It's really vulnerable. normalized. Me and my wife went to my cousin's house a while back, and we were visiting this Catholic family. Mm -hmm. She's married to a Catholic. He was showing off his new TV and his pornography channel. <laughs> and we were like, oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> this is normalized. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's actually a and his children were in the room. Yeah. How old are they? Well, she, she was, she's 20, she was 25. Who? 
Wayne's children in the room with yeah, showing yourself. Yeah. And the other ones maybe. My youngest one is 20. 20. Were they shows that he had downloaded himself into? No, no, this is a pornography channel. There's a pornography the channel. channel? Yeah. And they're watching? He was showing it off. Like Maybe. it was uh, something really great that he had. Like <laughs> showing it off. <laughs> like the scenery of BC. Like then I channel. realized, this is normal. This is, this is, this is, this is cable channel. channel. Cable channel from Telus or? I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know right, about yeah. you but ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. but I think maybe we need to take yeah. a little break. Yeah. And, um, well, you can maybe wrap up. Wrap it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, you have a few more things you want to add to, like become a fighter there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so why don't you do that? Yeah. And because we can go on forever. Yeah. 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 yeah, so like the New Drug is the largest anti poor organization, and it was set up in the United States. And um, if you check out their website, um, they actually have a lot of information on the Arms of pornography, and it's very well done um, because the website is quite interactive and they're constantly updating it. Um, their main target would be young audience, so they're trying to um, cater their website and their social media towards the young generations mostly. And their strength to fight, which is a Canadian anti porn movement, and it came out last year. Um, it's originally based. Um, in Ottawa, which is in Ontario. And um, it was created by this man who used to have a severe porn addiction. And it got really bad to the point where it was um, causing a lot of damage in his marriage with his wife. And he decided to make a difference but ever since he started having um, a child. And um, yeah, I, I don't really know his name. But um, he also speaks in presentations. Um, so he already went to some schools, churches, communities, and spoken. And um, during these events, they would also bring petitions um, for parents and kids to sign. Um, so they're related to the legislation aspect of the anti porn movement. Yeah. And thanks to that, um, the Motion 47 passed last year because movements um, they unite together. Culture Reframed, and Culture Reframed takes on um, a more feminist um, outlook or aspect against porn. And um, basically they're trying to redefine the pornified culture, so that's why it's called Culture Reframed, because of the whole um, empowerment movement um, by sexually exploiting oneself or displaying one's body. Um, they're trying to change that definition of empowerment um, to make the world a safer place for girls and women. Um, and that way, um, that way these girls and women, like as young as 17 or 18 years old, wouldn't um, feel encouraged to join the porn industry. Because the porn industry is laced um, full of drugs, physical abuse, and rape. So yeah, there's a lot of dark things happening within the industry too as well. And uh, so far there are quite a lot of I don't know the exact numbers, but there are some porn actresses and porn actors who used to work in the porn industry, and they mentioned that there's a lot of you know, awful things going on, um, like actors and actresses getting beaten up, getting drugged. Um, they're basically trying to drink away all their problems and not themselves. Yeah, so, so culture, they, sorry, the culture we afraid is it's uh, they're trying to make pornography look good. It, it's a it's oh. not a good organization. Oh no, it's a good organization. Oh, like all of oh, these yeah. are, um, all of these are activists. Oh, organizations okay. against pornography. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah sorry yeah. about that. I kind of think that was a lot. But yeah, um, because we live in a fortified culture, um, culture refraining is trying to change that definition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So they're trying to encourage healthier sexualities. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And um, on their website, um, there's actually a resource for parents um, to check out. Yeah. So they have a lot of links. Um, there's also this kids' Wi-Fi. Um, 
where you can actually install it at home. Because nowadays a lot of kids are in tech savvy, so they can actually hack through certain filters. Yeah, even um, this boy, as young as nine years old, he was able to hack through it. There's a Canadian documentary um, on pornography as well, and the boy was featured in it. Yeah, so he, he dealt with porn addiction um, up until the age of 13 or so. Strength to Fight was having their presentation here in Vancouver, uh, which happened um, once or twice. Um, they actually brought some of these technologies and their kid proof, and kid hacking proof. So um, with this Wi-Fi install, the kids can, they cannot hack through the filters and remove it. To like uh, bid, uh, bid angel. Bid angel. Um, bid angel is more so has to do with videos mostly, I guess, like films, uh, Netflix. Um, whereas kids Wi-Fi, it pretty much um, tries to filter all the websites out there, and all the content on the internet. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so sometimes. Um, Antiquarian movements would come here and they'd actually bring along these technologies and they sell them in person, or you can order them online too. And they're actually good for those who are really struggling with porn addiction as well. would be part of the abolitionist side of the anti porn movement because they want to get rid of uh, prostitution, pornography, sexual exploitation. Because um, as long as these things still exist, then so will the other problems continue to exist. And young generations are still being dealt with for So it's very important um, that we actually take in mind about the young generations that we're being involved with because they're part of our future and one day they're going to be um, taking control of our society. from. 
So basically, anonymous is um, an activist movement. So they focus on um, issues such as um, environmental sustainability, uh, government corruption, um, wars, ISIS, and all that. But also, um, there's some anonymous who focus on sexual exploitation as well, like child pornography. And there have already been um, anonymous activists who hack into certain porn websites. <laughs> yeah, mostly child porn websites um, to reveal the names of those who are partaking in this crime. Yeah. So that, that's their way of doing the activism. <laughs> yeah, but not every single anonymous person is a hacker. Like some of them are supporters. Uh, some of them are just trying to spread awareness and education, just like ethical activists. Yeah. And one of them actually um, made a video. And this is the last video I'm going to show. So the reason why they're wearing masks is to conceal their identity, uh, especially, yeah, if they're they're gonna, thought. especially if they're going to deal with um, government corruption. Or maybe all. replacing sex ed for kids in the digital ed. So anonymous can be anyone. Anyone can be anonymous. There's no actual registration for that. Age. A shocking percentage of pre-adolescent children are being exposed to cyber porn long before they're mature enough to process its graphic sexuality. It yeah, fills like parents of pre-teens like me with yeah. dread. And add to that those explicit lyrics in hip-hop and the elixir of social media, and suddenly the facts of life are X-rated. Nine out of ten children between the ages of eight and sixteen have viewed pornography on the internet. Winston <coughs> Danielle was eleven the first time she saw. Young teens look up to and adore. 
We are shunning bad celebrities so kids can witness that not everyone approves of corruption and there is punishments for those that have fallen down the wrong path. Of course Anonymous has bigger fish to fry, but we can't allow new problems to grow either. Children are the roots to the future. And if they get corrupted before they have a chance to change, then we are back to square one again battling another wave of corrupted adults. We all are obligated to stop corruption right at its roots before it grows too big to handle. The support we got has shown that many adults agree that something needs to change. So many might wonder, of all the other trash film celebrities, why did we pick on Kanye West? In case you have forgotten, Mr. West, started off this year using a very distasteful tactic to gain your attention and completely ruined a unique historical moment in human history, overshadowing it with Kim's photograph with Paper Magazine. How can you claim to be a renaissance man, and then promote nudity at a time when revolutionary things were happening with NASA? And yet, he thinks all his ideas are so profound. He thinks being a pop star automatically makes him the next Michelangelo, or Jesus, without even possessing the mind that goes with being a great teacher. This is less than laughable, Anonymous has simply had enough of the majority's tolerance and negligence to stop things like these. So, we did something about it and made an example of him. And this goes not just for Kanye West, but also, Little Wayne, Nicki Minaj. Katy Perry, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, Kesha, and Miley Cyrus. And speaking of her, Miley, what happened to you? You had it all, and now you blew it. You had so much potential to be the next Celine Dion of your generation. You could have been the greatest icon for women to be proud of and admire throughout history. You could have been a positive inspiration to your young fans. You could have been the one woman to change the industry to finally stop using female vocalists as sex objects. But instead, you decided to conform with the rest of them. Now people will only remember you for your downfall. Don't you want to be remembered for your bright personality? Your soul? Or even, your ideas? We are not attacking you, young lady. We only wish to send you a heart, so you know that someone cares. We want you to understand that each time you push limits to be more controversial, you are only destroying the lives of countless children who are watching. You came in like a wrecking ball indeed, more like an atomic bomb. But, your life had always been in the hands of Disney's perversion, so this is no surprise to us. But it is surprising that you don't even resist your own enslavement. You are no longer a person with feelings, your life now belongs to the sex industry. And you won't ever be happy, once you realize that nobody loves a all. Hmm. I wonder, how does it feel to be just an emotionless body for perverted eyes to lust over? Don't you feel robbed of your personality? Don't you have something valuable you've always wanted to share with the world instead? Well, nobody will ever take you seriously now. And you push these careless values on all of your old fans, who are still under the age of 18 and confused about where they should be in life. Shame on you, Miley, for being so stupid to fall for this. You are the epitome of everything that is wrong right now with America. Which brings up my final point. Artists like Miley wouldn't even exist in the spotlight in the first place if it weren't for the fans who continue to fund their careers when they take a turn for the worst. You see, this message is not for Mr. West or Miley Cyrus. This message was to you the viewer, because it is you, the consumer, who might have bought these artists' products and made them as successful as they are. Every one of you who claim to be fans of these trash celebrities have been voting with your dollars each time you purchased something from their websites or attended their shows. And now you all created monsters. To reverse this damage, all you ever needed to do was boycott the artists that deserve to be fired and support new artists with a more fulfilling message. The fact that this hasn't happened on its own already, is a reflection of where we stand as a society. So the tragedy of Marley Cyrus, tells us a lot about ourselves and the environment that we placed her in. Although Marley shouldn't be painted as a victim, she is a big girl and can make her own decisions. But it is we who are to blame for allowing our world to slump so low, and not doing anything about it. Hmm. 
It's a shame America has tried to be the hero for the whole world, but can't ever seem to be a hero to itself. We desperately need to make some changes immediately to the way we nourish our minds with entertainment, as well as the way we nourish our bodies. Let this be a lesson. We are beginning to see how all our choices add up, and affect the future. The world we see around us today, is a direct result of the choices everyone made yesterday. Never again will we be asleep to this. Soon Anonymous will be taking out all the trash celebrities and replacing them with artists who have real values. After this kids will be singing to more positive lyrics and dancing for fun, like it was intended to be, instead of growing up too fast. These things surrounding them as they grow up will promote them to think more creatively, and encourage genius ideas to emerge, instead of thinking at the level of a horny chimpanzee. Our goal is simply, turn our kids into freedom fighters and philosophers, and they will naturally choose the right type of music they want to hear on their own, simply because anything less will be degrading and boring to them. It is a positive shift that I see no reason why anyone would argue against it, except the corrupted. So in closing, when people ask us why we make these videos, why we attack misbehaving celebrities, why we hack terrorist websites, expose lying politicians, police brutality, cult leaders, and pedophiles, we do it all for our children, so that they can still have a world to experience the beauty of life, and nothing can never be more important than this.